Happy Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. If you are in California, I hope that you've been able to enjoy the amazing sunshine that we've had this week, which I feel like I was severely lacking in vitamin D. It's amazing how much everyone's mood improves when the sun starts shining. Um, let's see who we got on right now so far. Good morning, Allison and Vesper and Lisa. How's everyone doing this fine Friday? Hmm. Good morning. So as we wait for whoever's going to trickle in for this live, I wanted to touch on that yesterday was International Pi Day, or maybe it was just National Pi Day, um, as in the mathematical equation. And I read an article about this, and I thought it was pretty interesting. So pi is basically a measuring, and if I get this wrong, you can correct me, feel free. Uh, pi is the measurement of the circumference around a circle um, varied to the distance across. And Archimedes was the one who discovered this or, you know, created this. And he discovered it by taking steps around a circle. And what I thought was really fascinating sharing this at all is because to me, it immediately was a parallel to goal setting. So as he was calculating the accuracy of a circle, he found that the more steps he took, the more accurate the equation and the circle became. So he was doing uh, steps along lines where each line where it intersected, it would be the point of the outside of the circle. So he was doing, you know, a, a hexagon shape basically. So he would have like five steps here and then he would stop and he would have five steps there. And then again, he would have five steps here. And he started to add more and more steps to his equation and he found that the more steps he took and the more he specific he was about his steps the more accurate the circle became and the closer he could get to the actual true value of what pi was so i thought that was fascinating and i also thought that it really rings true when we have any goal <laughs> uh the more specific and the more accurate we are the more we can readily understand how to achieve our goals. So, I mean, this can be applied to all areas of our life, but especially in nutrition, like the more accurate you are measuring, uh, the more accurate you are, well, measurement, absolutely. Um, the more you are really honing in to the tiny details, uh, the more you will be able to truly assess how to reach your goal and also like you're not in the progress point that you feel like you would like to at this point point. Um, obviously, expectations come in there as well. Um, we can't get from point A to point Z without going through all the other points first. So understanding what's actually possible in a period of time is really helpful. Um, and so we have a ton of questions to get through today. And we're also going to go through some menu navigation. So I'm excited about that too, because this should be fun. Hoping screen share cooperates with me. So I'm going to get right into this um, and I'm going to start with like the general questions first and then we'll go into navigating menus. So here we go. Okay, so the importance of rest days when it comes to losing weight and strength training. This was a comment that was on the Facebook page and so I'm going to touch on it. So uh, if you are someone who trains really consistently and you're looking to build muscle, muscle burns fat more effectively. The more muscle we have, the faster our metabolic rate is. So it's important that we are focusing on building muscle if we have a strength training routine that's in our, in our mix. And in order for muscle to truly be built, you have to allow it to recover in order to complete the full process. So rest days are extremely important. And when we don't allow ourselves rest days, what will happen is that we end up overtraining. And overtraining basically shows up like your strength has decreased. Uh, your energy levels in the gym are now not as good as you might hope for. It doesn't really matter what you're eating. You just don't feel like you're really performing at your max during your training sessions. 
Uh, your sleep may not be as good, or you might be just really, really tired all the time. And you might find that your weight progress is stalled. If you have a weight loss goal and you're training all the time, you may very well find that it's stalled that way. Um, as a personal reference, I used to train, I don't know, I, I definitely overtrained. It was like six days a week, and it was some pretty intense training. And what I realized is that I wasn't seeing muscle gains and I just kind of felt like I was staying the same. Uh, and once I started adding in two full rest days, now this took me like some serious willpower because I'm someone that likes to move. When I put in two rest days and did something else for my nervous system, like maybe it was just having a nice walk out there or on Fridays I would get a massage and that would be like my self-care activity or it would be something that I put in place of my training session. I still felt like my body was being addressed, but it was in a different way and it was therapeutic. Uh, also like a sauna or a spa or getting in the hot tub or just a bath or whatever. All those things can be really great things to add instead on a rest day. So I really, really recommend it. Um, Different body types will require a different amount of rest. So if you are naturally a lean body type, you might actually require more rest and recovery because it'll be harder for you to put on muscle. For those of us who uh, kind of fall like in the middle range where we have an, a fairly easy time putting on muscle and we also have an easy time putting on fat, then, you know, about two rest days a week is really great. And for those of us who are having a harder time losing fat, you might notice that maybe one rest day a week would be ideal. And then making sure to get, you know, some steady state cardio in throughout the rest of the week. So I hope this helps. Um, so I will finish that one. And if you guys have any more questions about these topics as we go through, just go ahead and put a question at the bottom here. And OK. Oh, this is a big one. So the next question is about stress, but we also have a question here at the bottom that feels like it's the same. Okay, here we go. We'll start answering Kristen's question. So this is from Kristen from the Facebook group. It says, hey, Shannon, I won't be able to tune in for the live, but did have a request in how to deal with cravings. I know drinking water is a good tip, like if I'm just thirsty, not not hungry. But when I'm super stressed, food helps me to go into rest and digest mode, i.e. turn off. So it's been a journey bre breaking that conditioning, too. So I guess if you're craving something sweet or if you want to eat because you're stressed, uh, big topic, but any tips would help. Okay, so... I feel like this is a very common topic for the week. Uh, you're not the only one that expressed that you've had a stressful week and therefore food has come into play. So there's a, it is a big topic. So stress is, has many different forms. And when it comes to food, if we have conditioned ourselves to eat as a form of soothing, for stress, the first thing that I would encourage you to ask is where did that habit come from? Uh, take a look possibly at some of your past experiences and more so when you were little. Uh, did food come into play almost like something that was for comfort? Was that how it was presented to you? Um, in my experience, a lot of us have really different relationships with how food played a role when we were growing. And for example, um, one of my clients, you know, we uncovered that her mom would always give her and her sister chocolate um, so that they would go with her to places where kids maybe wouldn't want to go, you know, like sit in an office while she goes to an appointment or something. So her mom would basically reward them with an item to encourage them to do something. So as an adult, she uses sugar as a reward. Uh, the thing about sugar is that sugar is addictive. And so when we're craving sugar, there's usually a few different reasons that we might be craving it. And the very simple one is that it's addictive. So sugar begets sugar. And the more sugar we have, the more our body will start to crave it. 
The other aspect when it comes to sugar cravings is that we may be low in protein, which Kristen, I don't really think this applies to you um, because I think you're doing pretty well here. But in general, uh, sugar is our fastest form of energy. So our body can really get that fast. But if we have irregular blood sugar levels because we haven't had enough protein, uh, you'll find that your body will crave sugar uh, because the blood sugar levels will be imbalanced and that usually results in a craving of sugar as well. And then the last one, which I think is the most common in our environment these days, is adrenal fatigue. So adrenal fatigue really shows up when we are worked to the max, when we have a stressful environment, when our cortisol levels are being affected and they are shooting up. Uh, this can be a result of overtraining as well. Your body will crave more sugar as energy. But adrenal fatigue from overworking, not sleeping enough, stressing, just kind of running yourself ragged and not giving yourself time to recharge uh, will definitely cause a lot of sugar cravings because your body is low. It's basically saying, I just need Instead of us really giving breaks to ourselves, we tend to um, go for the easiest source of energy, which is, you know, coffee or sugar or something like that. So in terms of how to navigate that, I will give you my, so I, I would like ration my Halloween candy to last you the entire What I do now when I that when I start picking out stuff in my house, and instead I'll opt for something else. I will opt for something else that satisfaction of consuming something. So I'll use something like popcorn with like brewers or nutritional yeast on it, where it still gives me the satisfaction of having, but it's not giving me that refined sugar or you know something like that that might. steer me away from my goals and then kind of not help my so just cause more sugar cravings uh, so I will include things like that or I will substitute with a different kind of act uh, and that act may be is it I'm um, sorry uh, Allison is that saying is it my wife or is this a choppy connection my Wi-Fi oh sh mm. okay uh, so far, my internet looks like it's pretty good. Let's see here. <laughs> uh, uh, Lisa says Mercury is in retrograde. It, well, that makes so much sense for this week. Um, hmm. Shall I reboot? Let's see if we can't get a better connection here. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Maybe all it took was you guys saying something for it to get better. Let me know if it stops again. Um, okay, so coming back to this. Thank you. Lisa says she'll text me if it gets choppy. So to the, uh, let me see, where did I leave off? Well, I can almost like hear Lisa chiming in my ear because we have a cravings kind of like uh, checklist in terms of if you're craving something, then you ask yourself, okay, do I really need this right now? Am I really craving this right now? Am I craving this as a result of feeling truly hungry for something? Or is it that I'm just trying to soothe myself or just forget both of those things? I just want want it. Um, and then you kind of go into, OK, what's my answer here? So do I just want it? Well, then maybe you just want it. And that's OK. <laughs> if you just want it, have that and then move on with your day. But don't let it kind of trickle in and become this crazy, this this extreme habit. Um, but we have that checklist and maybe Lisa can post it here or we can just repost it in both of the Facebook groups. Um, there's, it is a big topic. Stress is a huge topic. Um, but the majority of what I want to convey is that our lifestyles here in the Bay area, especially 
seem to be so nonstop. It really seems like the people that I work with one on one, their jobs allow them to, you know, have three hours of sleep and maybe schedule a shower. And it just feels like it's unsustainable. And so I encourage you guys to schedule in time for self-care. And I know that might seem like kind of ridiculous, but it's so important because if we don't have that balance of self-care, we can't operate at full capacity. Like everything else suffers. Our job suffers, our relationships suffer, and most of all, we suffer. And then you are seeing that our food choices and our habits will suffer as well. Oh, awesome. Lisa just posted uh, the link to that in the comments. Okay, I'm going to be done answering this for now because we have so many things to get to. And I'll answer Vesper's question now, too. Uh, Vesper says, some of my athlete friends swear by intermittent fasting to reach their weight loss training goals. But this seems counterintuitive to the knowledge you've shared with us. Can the two be combined? For clarification, the if routine I am referring to is to one, one where you eat daily but limit the number of hours in which you consume food. Yeah, so I'm familiar with intermittent fasting. And for some people, it works really, really well. Um, and it works primarily well because of their um, because of their willpower and also their schedule. So for people who just like to consume a lot of food at once and they feel like they can do that more effectively with intermittent fasting, then that kind of works for them. Um, does their body love it? Perhaps not. It really depends on how they're navigating it. Uh, I find that for some people's schedules, it works really well. Um, if they don't have time to eat or if it feels like it's more stressful to cram a bunch throughout the day, that, you know, starting their meals at 12 and then finishing at 8 o'clock at night, it's better for their schedule and it's sustainable. So you can absolutely do that with your macronutrients as well. And there's all different sorts of intermittent fasting. Some people do intermittent fasting for 12 hours. Some people do 8. Some people do 6. So you can combine macronutrient uh, ranges inside intermittent fasting, and it actually works out really well when people do that. Uh, I find that it works better for men. Women tend to have more irregular blood sugar levels, and their blood sugar levels will drop more quickly than men because we will actually metabolize sugar more effectively. It's one of the risks of estrogen. And since we as females have more estrogen than males do, we tend to have more of a cyclical um, blood sugar level. And so intermittent fasting may not be the ideal for us, um, but everyone is different. And so if that's something that you feel like would work better for you and your schedule, then you can totally spread your intake in terms of macronutrients throughout three to four meals and put those in uh, an intermittent fasting time. Um, a feeding time and see how it works for you. And the only way you're really going to know is by trying it yourself because everyone is different. Uh, so it can absolutely work for people. You just gotta, you just gotta choose what's right for you and what actually makes sense. Um, let me finish answering that one. The thing that drives me a little crazy with the, uh, health and fitness industry is that when people are giving information, they never I wouldn't say never, but more often than not, they aren't being specific about who should try these things and why, and that each person is going to have a different response. So they're never like, okay, if you are this body type, if you have this, if this is your goal, then this would be for you. It just kind of feels like, oh, I'm doing intermittent fasting and this is great, and oh, I'm doing keto, and this is great, and oh, I'm not having carbs, and this is great. But that might be great for that one person, that doesn't mean it's right for you. So understanding what feels best in your body is really what we're trying to encourage you to um, experiment with, as Lisa's saying. Uh, but not no one plan is gonna work for everyone, which is why we're doing this whole um, customized program here. Um, okay, let me see here. I lost my place. Oh my goodness, so many questions. Okay, we did that one. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I will get to that one at the end here. There's a big topic, alcohol and friends. Um, give me a second. Going through these ones. Okay, there we go. This one is from Jen. She says, if I have a protein shake that includes protein powder, plus maybe some fruit as a snack, 
able to eat a meal soon after that as well? Or do I still need to wait for two plus hours before I eat? What if I added yogurt and or peanut butter and fruit to that shake? Okay, so Jen worked with me for three months privately, and now she's a part of our lovely community here. So in terms of what we've already discussed a little bit about training and nutrition around training, when our goal is fat loss, the ideal is to keep your post-workout intake to protein and water. And the reason for that is that your body will always use sugar for energy when it's being given sugar in the form of fruit or carbs or vegetables or whatever it is. And so our goal is to give you protein only to recover muscle tissue so your body continues to use the energy that it's using after your training session to continue to burn fat for energy. Because in your training session, carbohydrate that's kept in your liver and your muscle tissues to form contraction. So you will better off be able to use stored fat for energy in that post-training session or those post-training hours, excuse me. So we ideally like to just have protein. If your schedule doesn't allow that and you're like, I don't have time for just protein and then getting in a full meal. And Jen, if in, in those cases you wanna just add fruit and peanut butter, that's totally fine. That would be essentially the snack that you would have or the meal that you would have after that shake. So you could just kind of pretend that there's no meal that comes after that and you're just having like a meal, which would be the shake after your training session. And that can work as well, um, especially if your schedule just feels a, a bit cray. Uh, but otherwise, if possible, just having that shake is really ideal because your body will just absorb the protein go into its recovery process and, and be on with its, with its other projects. Okie dokie, here we go. Uh, how do we reset if we have a dinner somewhere and really can't calculate how much over we went? Okay, so this is from Allison. So in this case, let's say we went out to a dinner and there was just no way that we were gonna be able to understand what we were eating because there's sauce and you know it was a pre-fee menu and whatever the case is. What I would do is, first of all, if you're eating in a consistent macronutrient balance and you feel like you can now understand in your body if you've eaten more or less, then listen to that first. And then the next day, uh, if you feel like you ate more than usual and your body's kind of still full, then you can just decrease your intake the next day. Um, generally, if I feel like I had a really big meal and then I could see that, yeah, I was probably over in protein or I was probably over in a fat, I'll go lighter the next day. Um, I'll choose different items. I will remove items. Um, if it was really heavy on carbs or if there was drinks involved or something like that, the best thing to do is to reduce carbs the following day uh, by maybe depending on how much you feel like you might have gone over the, the night before. And what this does is it helps your body to use up the excess sugar that you may have now added into our fuel tanks. So our carbohydrate, uh, excuse me, our muscle, our liver, and our bloodstream. So it will basically help your body to use some of that excess fuel that you put into the tanks instead of like putting added fuel back in the next day. So you can just reduce slightly. So if your like daily goal, just throwing a number out there, was 150 grams of carbs and you feel like you might have had closer to 200, I would just reduce it over the next day or two. So you could go to 130 carbs the following day and then maybe 130 carbs the day after that and then get right back to your 150 on like day three. Um, that is the best strategy when you're like, oops, can't do anything. This is what happened. Uh, and then... The other strategy is that learn you can learn from it. So if you were like, okay, I go to this restaurant a lot and I don't know what's in that, so maybe I won't order that next time because I wanna know what's in my food right now. So maybe it's more easy to, for me to identify. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the week. If I am really trying to dial things in, I'm gonna try to choose whole food items. I'm not gonna choose the you know, chipino, I'm not going to choose the risotto. Um, I'm going to choose like a side of broccoli or a side of vegetables. And I'll ask them if they can steam them or not put oil on them. Uh, and then I'll choose like the leanest protein option and ask for them to put sauce on the side, etc. So 
I'll really try to make it as easy as possible for me to be accurate because the things that have all of the sauces and all of the ingredients mixed in are going to be so much harder to understand what's actually in there. And the reality is the cooks are not measuring that stuff. They are scooping it with a cup uh, and they're, they're not weighing that. <laughs> if you ask them how much butter's in something, they're going to be like, I don't know. I made a huge batch of it. So it's better to, you know, take responsibility and, and make it easier on yourself if possible. Okie dokie. I think someone else just joined on. I'm going to say hello. Oh, hey, Jen. I just answered one of your questions, Jen, so that'll be on the replay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Scrolling down, scrolling down. Okay, here we go. Uh, another one from Allison. She says, sometimes I go through a day eliminating all extra fats like avocado and cheese and only getting fat from pan cooking spray and tofu, and I still go over on fats. I'm not sure how to adjust this anymore. Okay, Allison, I checked this out. And um, do you have a day that you can reference for me um, that I can look at to review? Because I checked through a little bit of your index, and uh, yeah, and let's and let's just look over it if possible. And even better, if you're in a place where you want to get on the screen right now, we can totally do that. That's an option on these Friday Q and A's. I know we have a lag time here. Allison, are you there? Okay. In this case, I'm going to have some water. So again, the question is, sometimes I go through a day Eliminating all extra fats like avocado and cheese and only get fat from hams, cooking spray and tofu. And I still go over on fats. So one thing before you come back. Oh, okay, got it. Uh, let me know what day I can look at and then I can share with you. So one thing that happens when, cool. So it looks like that uh, Tofi Bon Mie bowl has 15 grams of fat, um, which is probably from whatever, you know, combination of ingredients that they added in there. The main thing that like put you pretty far over. Uh, otherwise, your day looks great. Like that's an excellent day. Um, yeah, that's super great. Saturday. Okay. Yeah, I see that. So it's just the pre-made items. Um, yep. I, I was looking at Saturday, March 9th. It says at lunch, there was a tofu banh mi bowl with half dressing. And that's the issue with meals that are already pre-made for us. Uh, that we can't then control the amount of fat that goes into them. So that will be harder to navigate. Um, and in that case, it may not have been the dressing that added the fat. It may have been the type of tofu that they added. Um, so things like that will come into play. But the rest of your day looks great. And realistically, if you were slightly over on fat, but you kept that same kind of day at, on a consistent basis, you would see some pretty solid results. Because um, overall, that looks really good. Let me know if you have any questions about that, Allison, or if you even want to come up on screen. So that usually helps everybody. And in the meantime, I'm going to get on to this next one. Okay, man, there were a lot of people who were sick this week. <laughs> so how to navigate macros when we are sick. It's like the change of seasons and flu season and oh my lordy. 
Uh, Lisa, poor Lisa was one of these people. So how to navigate macros when we're sick. So when we are sick, our immune system is really, really compromised. And the first thing that you want to ensure that you're doing is resting. Uh, the second thing is getting lots of fluid, um, right? When we're sick, we're usually going to be dehydrated. Uh, so we're going to want to make sure that we're doing those two first and foremost. And then we have that whole concept of starve a fever, feed a cold. So when I was younger, my mom taught nutrition. Um, she put us through private school through first and second grade teaching our school nutrition. And I found that I was sick a lot when I was little. And maybe I just didn't want to be at school. But regardless, I remember going home and feeling sick. And my mom would always ask me what my body felt like it was craving. And 100% of the time, whatever I shared with her that I was craving, that made me feel better. Sometimes not 100%, but it taught me that our body usually knows what it needs. Um, outside of like sugar cravings and alcohol cravings and things like that. But listening to your body and actually asking it what it what it needs is really helpful. And I think we're very far removed from checking in with our body and seeing what it's asking for. Um, the other thing is that you don't necessarily have to stay in your macronutrients, but you can find food items like bone broth, um, adding ginger and garlic and lemon to a lot of your items. Um, I used to make this tonic or I do make a tonic when I'm sick, which is boiling whole ginger root. Um, Sometimes I'll even boil garlic with it as well because it's really good for cleaning the blood. Um, and then pouring it in a coffee cup with um, a whole lemon squeezed, cayenne pepper, and I will just drink that. And I'll drink it pretty much all day long. And I will usually feel better within one day or two. And that's for colds. I will drink that for colds, not necessarily for fevers. Um, fevers, you really just need to rest and re recover and you need to get back on your plan. Um, but you do not need to necessarily look at your macros when you're sick. When you're sick, just listen to your body. Do what you feel like your body really needs um, and, and listen to it. What you're craving is probably what it needs and you're going to know that better than we ever will. When you get back on track and you feel better, then you can start diving into your macros again, making sure that you're eating whole foods, trying not to go right back into eating anything that's like super processed or high in sugar, um, just to help your body to heal. And also trying to stay away from alcohol. Because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I feel better. Now I'm going to drink again. And then it just goes right back. Okay, Austin says, I'm still low on that day and protein too. So you'll be low on carbs and protein or it'll show that. Um, just looking. Uh, this is what Allison's saying. I'm still low on carbs that day and protein too. So as I look at it, um, I'm seeing that protein is 104, carbs is 138, and fat is 44. So you're in your calorie goal for the day. And because your fat is a little bit higher, it's okay to go lower on carbs. Um, now that you see your proteins a little lower than the goal, you can learn from it and then adjust the next day. Okay, so Allison says, I don't know how to add more food without adding more fat. So a very easy thing to do would be to not have the tofu bon mi bowl. Um, that looks like a huge kicker just overall. Um, also, not all tofu is created equal. Um, there are a ton of vegetarian food items that are lower in fat than this tofu item. Um, Summit protein smoothie. Yep, I totally feel you. Um, have you, Allison, have you checked out our vegetarian food item list yet in the Facebook group page? You can also find a lot of protein in vegetables, in certain types of vegetables. Spinach has a good amount of protein, so does broccoli and uh, cauliflower. Cauliflower has a ton of protein. So it is absolutely possible. It just takes being a little bit creative. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Lisa says, Allison, I'd say hitting 104 grams out of 109 is a win. Yeah, for sure. Lisa says, each day will not be exactly perfect. That's 100% true. Yes. Yeah, so you're doing, you're doing great. 
And sorry, I don't have your other screen with your goals in front of me. I'm trying to save bandwidth here. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, I'm going to go right to the next one. Uh, let's see. If you want to change your goal weight to be lower, do you need to change your macros or does it just take longer to reach your goals? Uh, okay, so I posted this from one of the weekly progress forms. So uh, let me see here. So when we're looking at our goal weight being lower than what we may have previously thought our goal weight was, uh, you don't necessarily have to change your macros unless you feel like you are now at a steady weight and it's not changing. Um, and there's so many factors that are involved in that. So um, because I don't remember exactly which form this was from, um, if we are like, for example, if I feel like I am steadily staying at a certain weight, um, like right now, I don't think that I could get my body much lower. And if I did, it would take some pretty more, it would take more extreme action, which means, yeah, I would have to reduce my calories. And if I did that, I would have to probably reduce them by about a hundred Delta. So, or deficit. So if I was, you know, shooting for like, let's say 1450, I would then have to go to 1350. I promise I would not be very happy. <laughs> um, so that's one aspect. That's one thing you could do. Um, if you feel like you are at a standstill, if you feel like you are still getting the hang of this, because usually the first four weeks, you know, it's a learning experience and you're still trying to figure out how to balance everything out. Um, I would not necessarily change anything. I would make sure that you are being accurate. I would make sure that you are spreading intake throughout the day. I would make sure that you're weighing things when possible and then see how your weight continues to progress. If you are still seeing a drop throughout the week um, and then throughout the next week, there's no need to really change. You're just going to see that your weight is steadily dropping. But the reality is that we're looking for like 0.5 to 1 pound of fat loss per week. And any more than that isn't necessarily ideal because typically when we see a drop that's faster than that, we're most likely losing muscle at the same time. And we really don't want to do that. So I wouldn't recommend dropping calories too low. But if you and I can't remember who this is from, sorry. But if anyone has more questions about this, please let us know directly and we'll just take a look at your intake and we can kind of further understand what your goals are and what you might want to adjust because um, everyone is so different. I'm going to have to put someone's name on that next time. Okay, this is from Laura. <laughs> One of Laura's questions was, is it okay to have Arctic Zero every night? <laughs> Um, Laura, for your body type, absolutely. You're a very lean body type and you can totally have Arctic Zero, especially if your goal is to build muscle. And what you might even find is sometimes it's actually helpful to have a caloric surplus more than you're really used to while you are able to focus on intensity of your strength training programs. So for your body type, it would be really, really great to do a little bit of heavier lifting and not so much circuit training, because circuit training will help to burn calories, but if you're focusing on building muscle, we almost wanna reduce that a little bit. We want you to focus really on building the muscle, giving your body the appropriate rest time, and in that case, Arctic Zero is just gonna be additional calories for your body to build with. So for you, it's totally okay. Um, if you were going into like, a cutting phase or wanting to lose fat, then I perhaps would not recommend that um, because it does still have sugar in it. And it also has like some of the uh, more processed ingredients. So on a regular basis, our body doesn't love that to be so consistent with the processed food items. Um, but for you, I say it's all good. Just, yeah, enjoy yourself. Okay. Another one from Vesper. I'm on a macro plan that allows me 250 extra calories on day when I work out. How do I know if I am burning these 250 calories in a workout, especially if my workout routines varies from day to day? Awesome question. Okay, so your burning of the calories really has nothing to do with that surplus. 
That surplus is what we have allotted for the average person. And sometimes men will get more of a surplus. That's not about how many calories that you've burned. That is about what your body will require to fuel the muscle for contraction beforehand and also to recover. So we're basically priming the engine of your car for driving and then, you know, adding in additional fuel when it's done so that it can be ready for the next time. Um, It's not in terms of your caloric expenditure. Um, We, because your goal was, is fat loss. And if it's changing, let me know, um, because then we would want to change your ranges. Uh, But if your goal is fat loss, we want you in a slight deficit. And your, okay. And so your deficit uh, on rest days is based around your estimated BMR and Vesper, you should totally come in for an in-body scan at some point if possible, or I think you already did. You already did. Hold on. Just double checking. I have your stuff right here. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I don't see it. Okay. And I think you sent it to us. Did you? Okay, I have your progress photos, but I don't see that in my uh, in my folder on my phone. So I apologize for that. Um, however, your rest days are based around your BMR. So we do know that we have that. So that's awesome. So we're giving you a slight deficit for your rest days. And then it's still in a deficit on your training days because we are working around your BMR. Okay, awesome. Thank you. She says she'll send it to me after. Uh, So just again, the caloric surplus for training days isn't actually gauging how many calories that you're burning because everyone's going to be different. Um, The only time where this becomes an issue is when people are doing double training days uh, and when people are doing any sort of long distance endurance activity, um, Ironman or going on a long bike ride, a long run, things like that. Uh, kind of intake around training will definitely change and we'll have to modify. Um, But it's more so our focus is what we need to fuel the muscles with in order to perform appropriately, as opposed to gauging how much is being burned. Um, I hope that makes sense. Good question. Okay. I'm going to get into some of these menus. I may not get to all of them, but let's check it out. So I will be sharing screens here and this is for you Allison because you're here okay so we are looking at vegetarian options for plow (laughs) all righty well that looks delicious (laughs) oh my gosh okay uh, let me see. The first thing that pops out at me is probably that heirloom bean and kale soup. Um, I don't normally recommend soups, but we're looking at vegetarian options. And that is the first thing that pops out at me when I'm looking at menus here. And because we're looking as a vegetarian, uh, my kind of insight changes a little bit. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I mean, realistically, I would. So just question, are you straight vegetarian? Are you having any fish or eggs, Allison? Because from what I can see so far, I think I would recommend the chicory salad hold the cheese and the hazelnuts. And then... If they have that soup, that bean and kale soup, that would be a great um, add, which would probably give you a good amount of protein, a decent amount of protein, as well as, um, let me see if there's anything more in here. As well as some carbohydrate. Um, The other things, that's the kids menu. Okay, we don't need to look at that. Okay, cool. Wheat eggs. Oh, then that makes this way easier. Whew. Okay. 
Awesome. So in that case, uh, let me see. When I look at menus here, I'm looking at, okay, so anything that looks like it's pancake, French toast, I save those for recovery meals. If this is just a regular meal and you're trying to eat fairly good, fairly clean, um, then we're looking at what would be the leanest items. And sometimes that's going to be as easy as egg whites, uh, getting some toast, and then asking if they can throw some vegetables in them. Usually that's pretty easy when there's a vegetable scramble. However, on this menu, I'm not seeing that anywhere. We have grilled ham and cheese, the plow, Dungeness crab scramble. Creme fraiche is gonna be one of the higher fat options, so I would not recommend that. A fried egg sandwich also sounds a little bit heavy on the fat because of the fried part. Whenever I see fried, I think lots of oil. Um, then we have eggs Benedict. So there's a possibility in this case that you could ask them to do two egg whites poached instead. So just take out the egg yolk and then keep the English muffin, skip the hollandaise sauce, and then add spinach and mushroom to it. And that would be a pretty darn good breakfast sandwich. You can make it into a sandwich. Um, would that item work for you? Otherwise, I would go with the soup and the uh, salad if that would be an option for them. They have a daily menu. They also have a breakfast sandwich here. And in that case, I would ask if they could again do like fried or egg whites poached if possible. Um, but I think the best option would be the eggs hollandaise, hold the hollandaise, see if they can do egg whites only, and then add spinach and mushrooms. Cool, okay, great. Boom, that one's done. Okay, we're gonna close that one. All right, I'm gonna get to that one afterwards. Okay, so this one is from Nikki. Oh God, this is working. Last time we tried that, it was not working. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna share again. Next one is Trabaco Kitchen and Cocktails. I believe this is in New York. Okay, so this one's for you, Nikki. All right. Oh boy, okay, this is <laughs> it's like a game here. Okay, so this looks like it is Italian. I love pizza, I'm such a pizza girl. Um, but usually, unless I am planning ahead to have pizza, okay, so we're gonna do it like this. If I'm planning ahead to have pizza, then at lunch, I will keep it to like a salad, a salad and uh, lean protein, or I'll just have grilled veggies, lean protein, so that I have room in my dinner for pizza. If that were the case, let's look at some of these pizza options. It's impossible to really have pizza without cheese, so I just don't even try. Um, but I will try, if possible, to get a lean protein if it's an option, and I don't see that here. So the one that I would generally go for is the spicy sausage with broccoli, um, because at least you get some vegetables on there. Um, the Christina, the mushrooms, mozzarella, arugula, prosciutto, shaved Parmesan, and truffle oil looks amazing as well. And depending on how big these are, um, I might have one or maybe two slices. If they it's thin crust and it looks pretty delicate, then probably two would be fine. Looks like they have add-ons here. If you are not trying to have pizza and you're trying to be fairly clean, then I'm gonna start looking at salads like this and then the sides. So here, the Invernale with frise, radicchio, endive, walnuts, red grapes, grilled pepper, grilled pear, excuse me. That one looks like it may be one of the better ones. Um, I would hold the walnuts and cheese dressing on the side. Um, some of the other ones are gonna be pretty high in carbohydrates, which won't leave much room for much else. So like the baby kale has cannellini beans, which would be higher in carbs, so will the carrots. The fagiolata has lentils, garbanzo, sparrow. That's basically like a carb salad. Um, roasted and red baby beets, even though those are wonderful, delicious, super healthy, they're gonna be higher in sugar, thus the carb is gonna increase. 
um, insalata ruchetta, thinly sliced fresh rosso bruno tomatoes. Yum. <laughs> Wrong me. So hungry after this. Um, I would probably skip that because it looks like it is, it has the olives in there. It's mainly tomatoes, also fairly higher in uh, sugar when it's just tomatoes on their own. Um, and then we have piatti unica. Uniki? <laughs> So when I'm looking through mains like this, I kind of scan for first, okay, where's the main protein? So I can see automatically we have chicken, salmon, um, and then a kind of mixed seafood grill, a vegetarian option, um, house-made bread, grilled chicken rest. Wow, this, this actually is a really good menu. Um, I would go with the insalata de pollo and have the bacon and dressing on the side because then you can choose how much you want. Um, or the panino salmone. Um, I would switch the dressing from pesto mayonnaise to something else. Oh, never mind. That's a sandwich. Forget I said that. Like this is a big menu. Uh, or the salmon a la Mediterranea. <laughs> Sound like such a white girl saying this. Um, skip the walnuts, dressing on the side. Uh, skip the egg because of the whole yolk. So you can keep the fat down a little bit lower. And yeah, you've got a lot of options here. Um, there was some things on the top here. So sometimes um, during menus like this, I will look at some of the things like antipasti. Like grilled oct octopus is actually a really lean protein. And so because it's kind of something that I would never cook at my, on my own at home, I would order something like that. And then I would pair a salad or a side of vegetables with it. And that's a really, really lean combo. So that can always work as well. Woo. Okay. Did that help anybody? We got another one in here. We're almost out of time. Eep. Okay. Here we go. So this one is from Margarita. And this is a very regular restaurant here in SF. So if anyone else is ever going to go here. So this is Town Hall. And I believe Town Hall is more so Cajun. Yeah. Woo -wee. So here we go. This is going to be a higher, higher fat uh, options over here. All right. So oysters are actually higher in fat than you would expect. So if someone's ordering oysters for the table, have like a, a couple, but then just kind of go on with your business and choose something else. Oysters are definitely not a free lean protein item. Um, but some people kind of have, think that I had that idea about them beforehand. Um, so from what I can see so far, I would, because I'm a total foodie, I would actually get like the butter lettuce salad that has apples. I would put the walnuts, blue cheese on the side. Um, I love butter lettuce. Otherwise, the mixed greens, you know, put the dressing on the side. Both of those would be great choices um, because you are going here two nights out of um, the next like four or five days. You can try Um, and then we go into our main courses. So halibut would be um, black trumpet mushrooms, I would think. I would ask to get the verjus sauce on the side. And if you're going to have alcohol, then I would skip the potatoes and ask if they can add more veggies, if it's possible. The schooner bay, bay salmon, um, coconut curry lentils. Whenever I see coconut curry, I think really high fat. So I would skip that one. Um, <laughs> Grilled spice pork chop, that looks amazing. Cheddar cheese grits, they look amazing. I would not eat them. Um, I would either ask to get double charred broccoli. Um, pickled rhubarb looks awesome. Um, usually pork chop can be pretty lean, especially if you just cut all the fat that you can see out of it. So good option. Um, New York steak is gonna be a higher fat steak, so it would be really hard fat down in the equation and let me see yeah and I would not get the farrow because a lot of a lot of ingredients going on there 
And then as we come down here, Town Hall Classics, Tuna Tartar, um, Cornmeal Fried Green Tomatoes. I've had these before and they're amazing. Um, do for a recovery meal, but not necessarily for I see cornmeal fried. It's going to be very, very high in fat and carbs. Your golf shrimp could be a really great option if you wanted to pair that with a salad. So you can have one of your and add this. As um, veal meatballs will be very high in fat. Warm ham and cheese toast, high in fat. Buttermilk, nope. Fried chicken. Uh, pork ribs, nope. <laughs> Butterscotch and chocolate pot, peau de creme. Oh, my God. Is anyone else salivating? Uh, let me see. Me and th looking through those guys, I'm just gonna skip them because I'm gonna think that 36 ounce bone in cowboy ribeye. Hold. So let's say they're prepared for two to three people. Who is gonna eat? Okay, well it's bone. That's a lot. Um, we'll go down and see if there's any good items. Probably is right. Just fill everything else. Have a good amount of uh, oil or cheese or fat because of the cooking. So I think some of the main dishes here would be great. Um, as we said, the shrimp would be a good option if it was paired with the salad. Um, pork chops, skip the grits, add more broccolini. Uh, the salmon can work. The halibut can work. So there's some really great options here. And there's some really not so great options. <laughs> not that they're not great. It would just be hard to, uh, okay, that one's done. Um, this is pretty funny. Okay, uh, Vesper has another question here. I'm going to get to that one. Other strength training, which is great for everybody. What type of exercise is ideal for fat burning? So, great question. Um, the best is for just straight fat burning, or when our body will just use fat for fuel, is fasted steady state. So, for example, if you were first thing in the morning and have like a big jug of water with you and walk without eating anything for the first 30 to 45 minutes, it's an excellent way to burn stored fat. Um, it also just helps to get everything moving in your system, especially if you're drinking water. It's going to help to flush out all the organs. Uh, so that is a really effective way of fat burning. Otherwise, strength training will increase your muscle tissue, which will in turn help to burn more fat while resting. Uh, let me see. Um, is that it? Okay. So I think I'm going to hold off here because now we have two minutes left and that was a lot of information. Um, Laura, you already ate your dinner, so I'm going to skip that one. It looks like you did a really good job in what you did choose. And next week, I would love to get into more topics of alcohol and friends. And what happens when we start to reduce alcohol and how we might notice that our friendships start changing or how people respond to us starts changing. And um, that. So, um, wow, that went by really quickly. You guys, um, I'm going to have to sign off here because it's a busy day. Um, thank you all for being on here. Thank you, Jen and Vesper and Allison and Lisa, of course. I hope you guys have a wonderful Friday. If there's any other questions that you have, please feel free to post them in the Facebook group. And then if you want us to review macros or if you have any questions at all, um, please reach out to us there also. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye, guys.